we're going to have a look at one of the key historical debates. Did Augustus restore the Republic? Sources are pretty contradictory and it really depends on when they were produced. So in a weird way, can we actually say that the contemporary material is actually less reliable than the much later material because later writers were able to write with a greater degree of freedom? So how we're going to look at this issue of Augustus restoring the Republic is in the following ways. First of all, we're going to look at the numismatic evidence which displays Octavian's triumphant return to Rome after the defeat of Antony and Cleopatra at Actium in 31 BC. We're then going to look at what Res Gestae says in verse 34, and as a contrast, what Suetonius tells us in verse 28 of his coverage of Augustus. We'll then look at the first settlement uh, between Augustus and the Senate, and look at the later historian Cassius Dio's view of this settlement, We'll have a quick discussion about the Caipio Marina plot, as given to us by Dio, by Macrobius and by Valeus. We'll then look at the second settlement where we can really see Augustus, or the newly christened Augustus, really starting to tighten his control. And then finally, we'll look at the views of Valeus and Tacitus. So first of all, let's look at Octavian's return to Rome after the defeat of Antony and Cleopatra, looking at the, this, uh, this first piece of evidence. You can see here we've got a winged Nike that's being uh, represented here, and she's being represented on the prow of a ship. So it's clearly commemorating the naval victory of the then Octavian over Antony. We've got Octavian here in a triumphal chariot. And essentially, the message is all about one of victory and triumph. The second coin is pretty similar, produced in 27 BC. We've got Octavian yet again being depicted here. And we've also got Nile crocodile that's been captured, so a symbol of Egypt being captured. All of these are all about Octavian's victories, his triumphs. And the big question now is, now that he's undisputably the supreme figure in Rome, what happens now? Now, from Octavian, or the soon-to-be Augustus's point of view, he does produce material that shows that he restored the Republic. And what we mean by that is he gives power back to the Senate and to the people of Rome. Now, where we get that information from is a really fabulous piece of evidence, which is the Res Gestae. The Res Gestae, written by the man himself, read to the Senate after his death, and then inscribed on bronze tablets on his mausoleum. Now, here's a little reconstruction. Uh, it's just outside of the Arapacus Museum, the Altar of Peace, which again is another fantastic old custom monument. And what Res Gestae tells us is certainly Augustus's views, the way he wanted to be represented, especially in regard to the level of his power and the authority of the Senate. And really, for this question and this debate about the restoration of the Republic, the most important areas of res gestae is, is, is verse 34. You can make an argument, obviously, for verse uh, first five, when he refuses powers and titles, and verse six, where he says that he didn't want to take powers that were inconsistent with the customers of the ancestors. But in verse 34, he categorically says that he transferred the Republic from his power to that of the Senate and the people of Rome. He says at that point that he possessed no more power um, and authority than those who were his colleagues in his magistracy. So what we've got here is certainly Res Gestae and Augustus maintaining that the Republic has been restored. However, that's massively contrasted by Suetonius's view. Suetonius writes much later on under the, uh, in the reign of Emperor Hadrian. And for a certain, from a certain point of view, Suetonius can write a little bit more freely. And he completely goes against this idea that the Republic has been restored. And it's pretty obvious that when Suetonius is writing, that that is indeed the case. Do you remember, of course, that Suetonius is the director of the Imperial Archives and has access to Augustus's papers when he's producing his biographies, so it does make him pretty reliable. He says that Octavian twice thought about giving up his power. 
and that was after Anthony's defeat. And then the second time when Octavian was seriously ill in 23 and 22 BC. However, he doesn't think that this is um, this is a terrible thing. He says that the reason why Octavian keeps power is, is that he thinks it's bad for the Republic and for his own personal safety. So in 27 BC, Augustus, or Octavian is it, as he is at that point, renounces all of his powers. But even when he steps into the Senate and says this sort of rehearsed speech, giving up his powers to the Senate, he still holds these level, this, this level of authority. He had the oath of allegiance from the previous war uh, against Antony and Cleopatra. He's got control of the vast majority of legions, still has the powers of a, of a triumvir, essentially, and is still consul. Cassius Dio gives us a much more cynical view about Octavian's resignation of his powers when he covers Octavian's speech to the Senate. Dio is much, much more critical. He writes much later. So remember, Dio is writing about 200 years later. So again, he can be much more honest and much more brutal, I suppose, in terms of the coverage of what Octavian actually does. And Dio gives us phrases such as this. He says that the Senate plead for the monarchy and ex so make it look like they are forcing him to accept autocratic powers. And of course, this is what Octavian would have wanted. He wanted to look like he was reluctant to take these powers. Remember, as the adopted son of Caesar, he would have been painfully aware of the level of power that he actually had. When this was done, he was eager to establish the monarchy. So we've got the use of that word here. He wished to be thought democratic. And in regard to the control of the provinces where Octavian had the vast majority of the armed provinces and the vast majority of the legions, the aim was that senators should be unarmed for war while he controlled the troops. So what actually happens in this first settlement? Well, in the first settlement, Octavian is granted these various powers and titles. The important thing from Octavian's point of view is that all of these had Republican precedents and patterns and trends. So many of these powers, in fact, all of them, and of the awards had been given to previous Romans prior to Octavian. First of all, he's given the honorific cognomen Augustus. Now, again, he's not the first person to gain an honorific cognomen. Pompey Magnus, Pompey the Great, Sulla Felix, Scipio Africanus. There's a big list of Roman figures who've done something great for the state and then have been honoured by the Senate. So from Octavian's point of view, or now Augustus's point of view, this is not un-Republican. He's granted pro-consular imperium for 10 years over a massive um, chunk of the Roman Empire, but crucially has to manage those using legates. However, this is not a new thing as well. So we've previously seen that in the Republican era, Lex Gabinia in 57 BC and Lex Manilia in 66 BC had given Pompey a similar amount of power and imperium. Or equally, Pompey had been able to become governor of Spain in absentia using legates. Lex Vitinia gave Caesar the control over the, over the Gallic provinces for, for 10 years eventually. The Senate control of the provinces. So this again meant that Augustus has at least gestured that he wants to rule with the Senate. The Senate's provinces though are far more stable. There's only six legions in there. There's only three senatorial provinces, but it does signal that the Senate still has a role. Octavian is granted the Corona Civica, which again is a Republican award. Previous Romans have received this. He's granted it a, a golden shield from the Senate, which again is a gift. So on the shield is inscribed a series of words commemorating Augustus's courage, honour, justice and piety. And he continues to be elected consul um, for a big chunk of time. However, again, he's not the first person, first Roman figure to hold the consulship consecutively. Marius in 104-100 BC had also done that. So Augustus could argue that pretty much all of the powers and awards that he gets in the first settlement had a Republican precedent. What would be the counter argument is that none of these powers have been given to one figure at one point previously. Now, there's a, a reaction against 
Augustus's control, and we do have the Caipio Marina plot. If we want to talk about a bit more detail about the Caipio Marina plot, look at the presentation on Julio Claudian emperors and the Senate. Caipio Marina, two disgruntled senators, um, supposedly plot to assassinate Augustus. Valeus, who is a contemporary, near contemporary, is certainly very, very critical of them, calls them villains, and says that they suffered the same violent death they'd planned for Caesar. Valeus is corroborated by the much later writer Macrobius, who also talks about Caipio's attempts to kill Augustus. The important thing here is that there's certainly an indication of resentment towards Augustus's control over the Senate. And perhaps that, added to the serious illness that Augustus would suffer, leads to the second settlement in 23 BC. And the second settlement in 23 BC, to a certain extent, you can really see Augustus tightening his control. First of all, Augustus resigns the consulship. Supposedly, this is to reduce friction and competition amongst the senators for the consulship. The consulship itself is later reduced to six months term rather than a year. Augustus is granted Maius Imperium by the Senate. Now, this is really important because this gives Augustus greater imperium than the proconsuls and the governors. He's also allowed to extend that Maius Imperium within Rome's Pomerium, that theoretical boundary where returning governors and generals lost their imperium. Augustus is allowed to carry his Maius Imperium inside Rome's Pomerium, which means that he therefore has greater imperium than to control. He's granted the powers of the censor, which gives him a certain degree of moral authority in the, in the Senate. Later on, he'll become Pontifex Max, Maximus. And finally, Augustus is granted tribunician powers, tribunician potestas for life. Remember, he's not an actual pleb, so he can't be a tribune, but he can certainly have tribune powers. And uh, this also gives Octavian, along with his consular powers, his Maius Imperium, a huge chunk of further control. Our later writers um, are certainly deeply critical about this, none more so than Tacitus. Tacitus is deeply critical about Augustus's motives. He says that he can write freely because he's writing later on. And we know that Tacitus lives through and serves under emperors with some sort of negative reputation like Domitian. And this possibly colours his negative view about Augustus and his aims and his methods. However, that being said, he's pretty scathing. He says that Augustus seduced the army with gifts and the people with corn and everyone with the enjoyable gifts of peace. And talks about how easy it is for Augustus to therefore gain control. The bravest souls were dead, the surviving nobles happy with peace and prosperity, provinces happy with peace after years of war. So Tacitus is being critical by Octavian, about uh, Augustus rather, but equally, even he has to talk about the degree of stability that Augustus's control had brought to the state. This slight positivity from Tacitus's point of view is really sort of played upon by Valeus. Valeus is a really interesting writer uh, who writes um, under the reign of Augustus and Tiberius, so pretty much a near contemporary. So does that have an impact on how honest he can be? He tells us about another plot in addition to the Caipio Marina plot and the Ignatius Rufus issue, who's an equestrian. There is a plot by Lepidus, the son of Lepidus, that's, uh, that's defeated. But Valeus is, is hugely complimentary about all of the positives that Augustus has brought to Rome. Civil and foreign wars ended, peace restored, dignity to the Senate, courts and laws restored, freedom for mankind. He'd refused the dictatorship and try not to be consul too many times. So does Augustus or did Augustus restore the Republic? Well, your contemporary or near contemporary sources are certainly saying so. But does that reflect a level of control and manipulation? So res gestae, numismatic evidence and Valeus would all argue that Augustus restored the Republic. And by that, we mean the authority and dignity of the Senate. However, the further you go, the more critical our sources are. Tacitus, 
Suetonius and Cassius Dio are all arguing that Augustus did not restore the Republic. Ultimately, it depends on our definition of Republic and our use of the term res publica. If we're interpreting Augustus's claim as in restoring the common good, then absolutely, because we have the Pax Romana and relative stability after decades of civil war. However, if we're to interpreting the word republic by what we mean as senatorial control, the senatorial government, then Augustus did not restore this.